there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Germ warfare, a phrase destined to send shivers down anyone's spine. When the enemy uses biologically produced bacteria or viruses to attack, an idea and a practice as old as civilization itself. From the Scythian warriors who dipped their arrowheads in the decomposing bodies of the fallen two millennia ago, to the madman who mailed anthrax to US government officials early in our own century. germ warfare, diseases weaponized to attack, disable, even kill, weapons of mass destruction of the most hideous kind. But what if such agents of war came not from the enemies we know, but from within our own ranks? A new enemy is emerging, neither superpower nor rogue nation, neither terrorist group nor crazed individual. No. This new enemy is the natural world itself, a microscopic realm of bacteria. Bacteria within us. And not just any bacteria, but the so-called superbugs. These new agents of germ warfare are fighting back in response to decades of attack by us and the antibiotics that began with Fleming's discovery of penicillin in the 1920s and have since become our weapons of choice. So antibiotics were coined as magic bullets at the beginning of the last century. And it was thought that antibiotics really solved the whole problem of infections. However, after the use of antibiotics, it became apparent that resistance develops in the bacteria. So it has turned out that we need to be um, really more careful in how we use antibiotics and when. Like Frankenstein, it seems, we have created a monster. New types of bacteria now threatening to pay us back. So these superbugs have evolved through our use primarily of antibiotics and other drugs to target them, to kill them, to prevent infections and diseases. And as a part of natural evolutionary processes, these bugs are fighting for their life. They're fighting for ways to overcome and survive and become resistant to these drugs. And so they've adapted multiple mechanisms to evade the action a mechanism of action of these drugs and become essentially resistant to them. These superbugs are trying to take our fortress by stealth, creeping into our hospitals and homes, deployed on every surface and in tap water, covering our skin, playing a waiting game, invisible and potentially deadly. And so we find ourselves at war. Working on the age-old premise that to know your enemy is to give yourself a fighting chance, 
we must ask the obvious question. Just what is a superbug? And what exactly are we up against? Superbug. Well, a superbug most traditionally is thought of as a type of bacteria that is resistant to a, a full spectrum of currently used antibiotics. It's a very broad term that, um, uh, but most understood as in terms of the antibiotic resistance space. But we have many super bugs in terms of that can cause illness and disease, and they aren't always necessarily uh, resistant to antibiotics. But the most traditional understanding um, from the community is that it's, it's bacteria resistant to antibiotics. As usual, our friends in the fourth estate are largely responsible for this rather sensationalist and alarmist description. How I interpret a superbug, uh, well, there, there's more than one. There's quite a number. Uh, a superbug is a media, media term, uh, in a kind of a way of summarising for uh, the general pop the news audiences, uh, kind of the idea of a, res a bacteria that's evolved to reject drugs used to kill it. Uh, and th that happens all the time, but some, some infections are, so, are very serious and they've evolved in this way, and so they're called superbugs. So the classic one is golden staff. Uh, uh, which is a hospital-based infection, skin infection, which if it gets into a wound, can be quite, uh, and, and if it's untreatable, it can be quite serious. So superbug would mean those very difficult to treat um, pathogens. Pathogens that cause infections, where we've got only a very small number of antibiotics that work, or sometimes there's even no available antibiotic um, that works anymore against these infections. There you have it. Drug-resistant germs are fighting modern medicine, and particularly antibiotics, substances that can inhibit or even stop the growth of bacteria. The medical future looks uncertain unless scientists and clinicians join forces to find new ways of conserving the arsenal of antibacterial weapons we already have and developing new strategies to defend ourselves against the superbugs. In a sense, we have become our own worst enemies. Yeah, so I think we went wrong in the sense that we've been using antibiotics unchecked. We've, you know, in the 50s and 60s, we found this miracle drug, a drug and a chemical that could eradicate and stop all bacterial infections. And we use that without much thought or concern for the consequences. And I think now we're starting to pay for that as a society. Uh, it's always been the case that there were on planet Earth bacteria that are resistant to compounds that we use today as antibiotics. Uh, fungi make these, so penicillin uh, uh, is made by a, a fungus uh, and it was our invention of penicillin was in fact a discovery of the fungus that, uh, that secretes this drug. The fungus uses it in warfare against the bacterium uh, to, to stave off soil bacterium. So there have always been uh, drug resistant bacteria because there have always been drugs, it's just that we weren't using them as drugs previously. What we see now, though, is a huge increase in the prevalence of the antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Within a population, uh, if you're not uh, throwing too much antibiotic into the environment, you would expect that a really, really small number of the total population of bacteria would be resistant. If one of them infects you, then in the olden days, it was most likely going to be an antibiotic susceptible one simply because of the numbers. Now that we've increased the proportion of antibiotic resistant bacteria by overuse and misuse of antibiotics, uh, we have the reverse situation where it's most likely that you'll be infected by a drug resistant bacterium rather than a drug sensitive one. And so we somehow have to try and work backwards uh, in, in the way in which we've put this evolutionary pressure on. But it has always been the case and will always be the case that there are some antibiotic resistant bacteria in the environment.
Paradoxically, it's when the medical experts we know and trust are doing their best to help that some of the greatest dangers arise. I think basically we look at our skin and our skin is covered in, in bacteria, which people often don't necessarily realise and recognise. And a lot of the bacteria just live there happily, not causing any problems. But when you do surgery, so when you make a cut in the skin, these bacteria on the skin can suddenly get into the wound. And in that setting, they, they uh, then instigate the infection. But exactly the reason why they go from living happily and harmoniously on our skin to uh, causing problems in the wound is something that we're really only just beginning to, to understand. And it's a, quite a fascinating area as to why you know, these bacteria behave badly in the setting of a wound. They behave so badly, in fact, that some experts are predicting doomsday effects flowing from apparently innocuous causes. If we don't manage new ways to combat antibiotic resistance, the worst case scenario would be catastrophic. I think people will regularly die of scratches and cuts and, and regular abrasions. I think all of modern medicine would change. Going into surgery would now be a life-threatening decision. Do you put yourself at risk from c contracting an antibiotic resistant infection that we have no mechanism to cure? It's a terrifying prospect. I guess the fears for, for us is really that we know that a lot of surgical procedures, for example, joint replacement surgery, have you know, lots of benefits for patients. So people who have arthritis are able to then walk around without pain and live normal, happy, fulfilled lives. But the concern for me is if we begin to see increasing amounts of um, bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, perhaps those benefits from the surgery will be eroded. So many of the advances that we've made in patient care, particularly in surgery, may be eroded by uh, this increasing amount of drug-resistant bacteria. And that's probably one of the, the biggest fears I have, that all the wonderful advances we've made in modern, modern medicine may actually be negated by the emergence of, of drug-resistant bacteria. But rumours of our impending demise may be ill-founded. There is some good news amidst all the doom and gloom, especially if you live in a country like Australia. Sometimes the tyranny of distance can be a blessing in disguise. Internationally, we are seeing a lot of cases of very difficult to treat infections in places like South America, um, also South Africa and Southeast Asia. However, even in Europe, in um, places like Greece, there, this, the number of um, resistant bacteria has been increasing dramatically. At the moment, the situation in Australia is not quite as serious as in other parts of the world. However, we are seeing more outbreaks of those difficult to treat infections and also due to the international travel as well, this problem is increasing in Australia. Uh, overseas, there are definitely seeing increasing numbers of superbugs than we are in Australia, as well as the superbugs are more extreme, so they're, they're, they're much more resistant to kind of all currently available antibiotics. And the issue is, is that it's much more commonly seen in the community being in, you know, standard things like water fountains or puddles of water around soil, um, in, in, in rivers and streams. So very much embedded within the environment. And, and the drivers of that appear to be uh, inappropriate and misuse of antibiotics in the community. We also have 
infections from people coming, whether it be travellers who have, you know, or people who have recently travelled who then develop an infection. And we know that if they've been travelling to certain countries, they're at much higher risk for an antibody resistant infection or a superbug type infection. And this is particularly relevant for Australia because the very high rates are within our, our neighbours, our, our region, whether it be parts of Southern Asia or Southeast Asia. Uh, we know that there's very high rates of, of superbugs within the community. And if any of us travelled uh, to these parts of the world and came back, we would have a very high chance of being a carrier of a superbug within our, within our gut. And rates of that would be in the sort of, in Southern Asia, it's probably about 70% of us coming back would be uh, a potential carrier of a superbug within our, within our gastrointestinal tract. The other aspect around yeah, industry in countries uh, such as in China and India, these emerging markets, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's poor regulation around um, waste material. So from big pharmaceutical companies, if you sample the water around a big industry, a lot of that water will have high concentrations of antibiotics in it. And that goes then into the, into the soils and the streams, and then that drives the environmental bacteria to become resistant to our antibiotics that we need to use for humans, um, and creates a big problem in the community. So I think that there's a lot to learn around regulation of antibiotic use, both in humans and in industry and agriculture. Problems may also arise, not because of invasions from abroad, but as a result of invasive surgery. So I think in the hospital setting, the most common cases that we see relate to infections from foreign medical devices, whether it be catheters or ventilator tubing. Uh, and all these sort of processes and these interventions, whether it's a catheter or a, in the vascular system or the urinary system or the ventilator tubing, it disrupts our normal immune responses and our, our normal defenses against invading bacteria. So the most common infections that we, we're seeing are things such as pneumonia, so chest infections, um, infections of the urinary tract, infections, intra-abdominal infections that might occur after surgery, uh, wound infections after surgery. So that's the sort of most common group of infections that we're seeing. The most commonly known infection is golden staph, or Staphylococcus aureus. Called golden because of its colour in a petri dish, it lives on our skin and is normally harmless, though sometimes causing minor infections or boils. But it is a big problem in hospital environments. Transmitted through intravenous lines, catheters and surgical wounds, it can also spread via physical contact, respiratory droplets and food. it is also becoming harder to defeat. Multi-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, can only be treated with the antibiotic vancomycin, but some strains are becoming resistant even to this last line of defense. A golden staph bacterium partially resistant to vancomycin was found in Japan and designated VISA for vancomycin intermediate Staphylococcus aureus. Another highly aggressive bug, which is vancomycin resistant, is Enterococci, or VRE, identified in Australia. This is a bacterium that lives in our gastrointestinal and genital tracts and can be a problem in post-operative patients, infecting wounds and causing septicemia and endocarditis, or heart infections, and urinary tract infections. At the moment, less than 1% of this bug is resistant to vancomycin, but some strains also resist other antibiotics, 
which could make this infection unstoppable. Streptococcus pneumoniae spreads through respiratory droplets and can also cause meningitis and septicemia or blood poisoning. It can also cause sinusitis, bronchitis and ear infections. In Australia, half the strains are resistant to one antibiotic and some 30% are resistant to three or four. As such, a common infection in people Streptococcus is considered potentially more dangerous than golden star. Haemophilus influenzae, another common infection of the ear, nose and throat, can cause bacterial meningitis. 25% of strains resist most common antibiotics. Since the late 60s, gonorrhea has become more resistant to antibiotics and now resists penicillin, tetracyclines, and the newest groups of antibiotics. There's an old joke about not going into hospital for fear of coming out with something worse than what put you there in the first place. Some well-informed people aren't laughing. So whenever you give an antibiotic, there's always a risk that a patient might have um, a complication from the antibiotic itself. So common things are that they can have allergic reactions, uh, so things like anaphylaxis, which we're familiar with, but also um, rashes and other uh, impacts from the antibiotic. But also we know that the antibiotics increase your risk of getting other infections, and these infections are due to more resistant bacteria. So they can get diarrheal infections due to organisms like Clostridium difficile. But also, strangely enough, when you're giving these antibiotics to prevent wound infections, it actually increases the risk of getting wound infections to more resistant bacteria. So whilst you're trying to, to do good and trying to prevent harm, it actually inadvertently might lead to more harm for the patient. Anaphylaxis is an acute allergic reaction to the introduction of foreign substances into the body. It's by no means the biggest cloud on the horizon. So my worst fear is that we lose control and we no longer have any antibiotics or any drugs available to treat and combat some common infections, and that a lot of modern medicine is gonna be essentially abolished. We'll no longer be able to perform surgeries. Uh, many clinical settings and clinical procedures won't be feasible due to the threat of these antibiotic infections, antibiotic resistant infections that we can no longer treat. Like most wars, this one is being fought on several fronts at once. So I think, you know, historically these antibiotic resistant bacteria have often been thought of as just in the hospital system. So that it's contracted via, you know, the hospitals, there's a lot of drivers of antibiotic resistance that we can talk about in a hospital system. But now it, that we're seeing antibiotic resistant bacteria in the community as well. And the way that we're contracting these bacteria is often through our food or water source or the environment that we're, that we're in. We're very much interacting with, with our environment, with animals, um, our, our travel to different countries and the different foods and, and water that we are exposed to um, then allows us to become carriers or colonise with these potential superbugs. Once again, there are those who can see the way forward. So the reason that bacteria evolve resistance to anything in their environment is that bacteria are extremely good at conquering new environments. Uh, so a bacterium that can live in a hospital, uh, when faced with something that would, um, a, a drug that would make it die, most of the population will die, but there'll be some bacteria that for whatever reason, based on their genetics, are able to resist the antibiotic. And this is just, this is a force of nature. This is not something that you can do anything about. It's the basis for the evolution of life on Earth, and so it's not a bad thing. Uh, it's just that in this case, the outcome 
is uh, something dreadful, an, an infection of a person that could well result in their death. And so the evolutionary uh, ability of a bacterium to resist an antibiotic is, is not something we can stop. What we can do though is work out ways in which we either slow down the rate at which evolution will occur or find some other way, uh, something, you know, a, a completely alternative way of, of, uh, of getting rid of the bacterium. So just in the simplest possible um, uh, explanation of this, you can kill bacteria with a drug, uh, but you can kill bacteria with extreme heat, and this is the basis for autoclaving instruments before an operation. You can kill bacteria with uh, extremely caustic soaps, and this is the basis for scrubbing down hospital theatres afterwards. So there are other ways that uh, bacteria can be killed, uh, and what we need to find are, are, are therapies that would be alternatives to the, to the drugs uh, in order to get around this problem of the evolution of drug resistance. For some, that way forward seems to lie in combining the fruits of work in the theatre and in the lab. So my research at Monash is in, in sort of prevention of infections following surgery, so a lot of trial work, um, also looking at why infections develop. But then also uh, I look at how do we use antibiotics wisely, um, particularly in the surgical setting. Uh, so there's a lot of symmetry between my clinical work and my academic work. One of the first consequences of this approach might well be a radical rethink on hospitals. Not just how we are treated when we are in hospital, but the way we design and build hospitals in the first place. Yeah, I think hospital design is, is really crucial. I think that superbugs within a hospital setting not only can be on the patients and on the devices around the patient, but that they can be in the hospital environment. And I think our appreciation of that is only increasing and increasing over time. And, you know, a prime example might be that older hospitals might have multi-bed bays where you have four patients in one room, all sharing the same bathroom. And in terms of transmission, that would be a very high risk from person to person, as well as within the bathroom. So I think in terms of new design, Infection prevention and control is really a high priority in, in new hospital design uh, in terms of obviously having new uh, single, single bed bays for patients uh, uh, and, and dedicated uh, bathroom facilities. Taken to its extreme, this might even lead to a further paradox. Designing facilities that do away with water, always considered the most fundamental requisite for healthy human life. Um, I think the other thing that's being talked about at the moment is, is around water. Uh, and you know, some of these superbugs love to live in water. And it could be even the taps and the sink systems that are used in hospitals. So there are now discussions about intensive care units in certain parts of the world, thinking about having no sinks and no taps and a water-free intensive care because they think that that's an important reservoir of superbugs that can easily be transmitted between patients and obviously new patients coming into the intensive care. So I think there's a lot of new things that are being thought about around design um, and also, I guess, around the ability to decontaminate or decolonise or sterilise uh, the environment uh, and, you know, might be curtains and, and surfaces and bed rails, etc. So there's a lot of research going on in terms of how best to, to sterilise a hospital environment. Um, and there's great exciting technology, whether it's hydrogen peroxide vapour um, or other types of innovative methods. The relative ease with which antibiotics can be obtained in some places is also of concern. So, for example, not needing a script to need to get antibiotics, they can go straight to a pharmacist and just get antibiotics without a doctor requiring a script. So that is very common in many parts around the world, particularly in resource-limited settings. In other words, we need to pay closer attention not only to our hospitals, but to the wider world in which the use of antibiotics 
sometimes without due care and attention to the consequences, has become so widespread. So it's not just hospitals where uh, we're concerned about antibiotic resistant bacteria or superbugs. Uh, environmentally, they're a big problem too. In agriculture, we use uh, antifungal sprays on our crops. And these are very similar to the antifungal drugs that we would use in a hospital to treat a patient with a fungal infection. We also use antibiotics uh, in agriculture, sometimes therapeutically to treat uh, animals uh, to prevent infections, but often not therapeutically, but rather because they improve the rate of growth. And so pigs, for example, are fed antibiotics. As a result, the bacteria on them and in them are antibiotic resistant. And on top of that, you have antibiotic residues that uh, occur in their meat and in their uh, feces, which are then used to uh, fertilise crops. And so we're constantly uh, overloading the environment outside of hospitals uh, to promote the evolution of antibiotic resistant superbugs. Inadvertently, not because we wanted to, uh, but it's a big problem. You therefore have community acquired infections by superbugs as well, where people just by being out in this environment can acquire infections uh, as the basis of superbugs. In the end, it will be the case that a simple scratch from gardening could be something that would give you a, a really dreadful infection that may not respond to the antibiotics that the hospital has. Another part of the answer is antibiotics themselves. Not only the development of new ones, but the strategic approach of using existing ones in previously untried combinations to produce a result whose whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, so there's several strategies that are, are being pursued at the BDI here at Monash uh, in, that are alternatives to coming up with new drugs. Um, one of the fascinating things is the idea of using multiple uh, either antibiotics or an antibiotic and a different drug uh, which can be used in a combination therapy uh, that will be more difficult for the bacterium to become resistant uh, to. It doesn't stop resistance, but what it does is ex extend the window uh, over which it takes evolution to finally catch up to um, uh, becoming resistant to this therapy. Uh, ultimately, perhaps it will, we will come across a combination therapy uh, which will be impossible for bacteria to, uh, to become resistant to. Um, that's a great hope, of course. Um, another thing that we're doing is to move right away from the idea of uh, drug resistance. So there are several people here at the BDI who are looking at ways in which you could instead treat the patient as opposed to the infection. And by that I mean to stimulate their immune systems to, to use a, a, a drug, or which may be a drug that's existing, if we can work out the right sort of way of delivering it, or it may be a drug which needs to be uh, uh, discovered. Um, but the idea here would be that if you had a compound which would promote the immune system to make it stronger uh, than the bacterial infection, or indeed the fungal infection, uh, then you have opportunities where you can treat the patient rather than treating the infection. The great advantage of this strategy is that the patient won't become resistant to this drug. So this is a drug which you can rely on over generations. Uh, the bacteria won't know what's coming uh, and they won't be able to respond to the fact that a super aggressive immune system is now hunting them down. Often seen in a skeptical modern world as enemies in their own right, pharmaceutical companies have traditionally driven the development of antibiotics and their deployment on the medical battlefield. So I think that historically um, there was a lot of interest in antibiotics, but from a business sort of model from, for industry and big pharma, antibiotics were a really challenging area because you develop an antibiotic, all the doctors uh, want to try and prevent use of that antibiotic because they want to save it because it's very you know, precious in terms of its uh, utility. Um, and then uh, by the time that the patent is up, uh, then they've just started to use it. Um, and you know, from a business financial model, it appears historically that's been a problem. Things now, the governments around the world have, have realised this, and now there's a lot of incentives and, and ideas to try and improve the kind of business model around antibiotic drug discovery and development. And so now there's still a few uh, big pharma companies who are showing a great initiative in this space. 
um, and, uh, and are still producing new antibiotics. And I think the pipeline, you know, over the last, as, 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 you know, last two to, to three years is looking quite exciting in this space. And it's already coming into the clinical interface. Um, so I think that it's really a responsibility both of big pharma as well as public and government to work together to try and incentivise the development of new antibiotics. Monash University in Melbourne, Australia is on the cutting edge of this research with a multifaceted approach to the problem. My work involves studies in a laboratory where we look at the effects of different antibiotic treatments on difficult to treat bacteria. And also it involves mathematical modeling in order to describe the relationship between antibiotic concentrations and effects. So we get the bacteria from patients from the hospital. Um, so that's patients with difficult to treat infections. And then in the lab, we can expose the bacteria to all sorts of different antibiotic treatments, um, including high doses or different ways of delivering the antibiotic, such as a short infusion or a continuous infusion over a whole day. We, can, we will also test antibiotic combinations. And in this way, we can simulate what happens in the human body and find out how these different types of treatments work. The overarching goal of our research group is really to beat and tackle these superbugs. And the way we do this is really a, a multi-pronged approach. Uh, I have a research group that, that starts off at the bench to understand how these superbugs, what are the mechanisms that they do use to cause disease. And if we can understand those mechanisms, then we can look for novel therapeutics that can prevent those kind of mechanisms and disease. The second is then to move into the sort of area of rapid diagnostics. How can we quickly identify that we're dealing with a superbug or not? And that's really crucial to target our, our and, and rapid treatment of these superbugs and outcomes for patients. And then I guess the next is about best use of antibiotics. How do we use our antibiotics, our currently available antibiotics, in the best possible way to prevent the emergence of resistance and to best kill off superbugs? And I guess more broadly then is about transmission. How do we prevent transmission from environment to patient, from patient to patient, from healthcare worker to patient? And that is both within the hospital setting as well as out in the community. And we're really reaching out into the community, particularly in nursing homes, to understand the role of nursing homes as a reservoir of superbugs. Sometimes, too, cutting edge research can turn into a different kettle of fish, almost literally. So we use zebrafish in the laboratory environment because they are a great model system to study how the host immune response responds to superbugs. We're able to use uh, the, the fish to uh, image in real time how the white cells, the main immune uh, cells, uh, attack superbugs in real time uh, with uh, you know, real infections, whether it be in the bloodstream of the zebrafish or in the soft tissue of the zebrafish. And we can do this and we can really understand processes of both how the host and the pathogen are interacting. And by doing this, we've been able to identify novel pathways in the bacteria that we can potentially block to augment or to facilitate an increase in immune response so that the neutrophils or the white cells can kill off the superbugs more rapidly. So zebrafish have the real advantage 
of uh, particularly in their early phase, which is called the embryos, they've, they've, they're transparent. So we can do microscopy imaging of the zebrafish during an infection and you know in real time. The other thing is that they're we can manipulate the genetics of the fish so we can actually have fluorescent white cells. So if we have red fluorescent neutrophils or white cells of the fish and we have green fluorescent superbug, we can actually look in real time how they interact uh, and do very detailed imaging and microscopy. Sometimes it's not a matter of finding something new, but of taking a fresh look at something once known, but perhaps forgotten. For example, there is an antibiotic that fell out of favor many decades ago. Polymyxin E, or colistin, first developed in Japan and used clinically in 1959. It was known to be toxic to patients' kidneys. However, it is an antibiotic of last resort for many types of resistant gram-negative bacilli. We came to work on colistin um, because it was starting to be used increasingly um, and in recognition of the fact that um, it was introduced back in the 1950s, um, it came onto the market at a time when there were not many studies done during development of a drug to understand how to best use the drug, uh, to understand its pharmacology and so forth. And so basically, doctors, when they needed to start using colistin again, were basically shooting in the dark. They didn't really know which doses to use for particular patients. So the work that we've been doing is basically uh, developing essentially the large body of evidence um, for how to best use colistin. That's the work that we've been doing. Last but not least, what if we were able to turn the tables on the superbugs and do what they have been doing to us, attacking them from within. Another area of renewed interest is in bacteriophage, an almost forgotten field of research. There are some pockets of continued use of this little-known treatment, which uses the viruses that live within bacteria to consume them. Research is gathering momentum on phages and the lytic proteins which can cause dissolution of bacterial cells. So a bacteriophage is a tiny, tiny virus, and it's a specialized virus that only infects and kills bacterial cells. So it doesn't recognize or infect human cells. Uh, it won't affect the general microbiota. In fact, it's highly specific for a specific bacterial strain, and it will bind, infect, and replicate within that bacterial cell, and then it will eventually burst and kill that bacterial cell and release more phage back out into the surrounding environment. Once again, it seems the use of bacteriophages is a case of relearning what we already knew and turning it to our advantage. Phages were discovered in 1917 by a doctor called Felix de Harel, and he was a French-Canadian microbiologist and he noticed these plaques or zones of clearing on his bacterial plate. And he did a lot of study and investigation on them and proposed them as a, a virus that infects and predates on bacterial cells. So they've, they've been around or known about by humans for over 100 years. In fact, we discovered phages before we discovered antibiotics. And they were used as an antimicrobial agent for 20, 30 years before Alexander Fleming discovered and used penicillin. They stopped using phages because they're a biological entity, they're a biological virus, and being part of biology, they're extremely complex and they're extremely diverse. And so unlike antibiotics, which are defined chemicals that we know their structure and the mechanism of action, phages are very different. They can be extremely unique, extremely diverse, and that makes understanding them and applying them much, much more complex. And so it's taken us a long time to understand their biology and to be able to use them in a therapeutic setting. While war has often opposed East and West, the war on superbugs makes allies of enemies in a common cause. So Eastern Europe never really gave up on phage therapy. Um, a lot of labs and institutes in Poland and Georgia and Russia 
continued on with phage not only research but also therapy. Uh, and while the West was caught up in antibiotics and their use as a miracle drug, a lot of Eastern Europe still used phages as a way to treat and combat bacterial disease. And still to this day, one of the biggest phage therapy clinics in the world, the Eliava Institute, is based in the Republic of Georgia in Eastern Europe. There's more phages than any other organism on the planet. And so they're everywhere. But the problem with phages is that they're highly specific. They'll only typically recognize a certain type of bacteria. So in order to use them therapeutically, you need to isolate and identify the phage to be able to use it to treat and target a specific bacterial infection. So what the th clinics and uh, research institutes in Eastern Europe have done have stockpiled huge collections of phages, huge libraries of phages that have antimicrobial activity against a broad range of different pathogens. And they've had this experience in these libraries for, for decades now, and they're now using these to treat difficult to, to combat bacterial infections. Phages, new drugs, clever hospitals, a responsible approach to antibiotics and their use, all well and good. But what if none of the above should work? Where would that leave humanity in its war against the superbugs? What I think is a, a real tragedy, so the ultimate irony is that uh, as we get better and better at defeating cancer through the research investment that's been made and the clever uh, therapies that have come about, uh, more and more of the people who die as a result of cancer will die from infections. Uh, they'll die from infections because of operations they have to have to save their lives from the tumour or from the other cancers. Uh, and they will end up with a post-operative infection which is multi-drug resistant, which the doctors can't do anything about, and that will be their fate. Particularly in the case where the person may have had to undergo chemotherapy or radiotherapy, which impacts their immune system. Um, and I just think this is such a dreadful dilemma that we really have to up our game in terms of what we do, looking into research on infections, on microbes, on bacteria, on fungi, uh, to make sure that this terrible tragedy doesn't uh, eventuate. In any battle, you can run or you can stand and fight. How are we reacting to the superbugs? Are we aware and should we be afraid? I am. I'm frightened for the future. Uh, I, I firmly believe that we can do something about this. I think this is a dreadful and huge problem that can be turned around. And so my fear for the future is that we won't act hard enough and fast enough to actually turn the problem around. If you think about your kids and your grandkids, it is something that uh, you get scared about. Uh, it's not the only problem for the future that's a, a dreadful one, but it really is one of the big ones. And we do have to act more and more quickly uh, if we're going to see a, a solution uh, soon, soon enough. The fears are that um, these bacteria are extremely smart and intelligent. They've shown an amazing track record to be able to get around our new antibiotics all the time. And I guess our fear is that if we let our guard down or if we take this for granted in some way or take our antibiotics for granted in some way, that these bacteria will push on and really will become resistant to everything that we have in a highly prevalent manner and cause very life-threatening and serious infections. So I think that's a, a real driver for humans and, and innovation is to stay one step ahead of these very, very, very smart uh, superbugs.